I asked you this off air, Ben. I want to ask you again because the last time I saw you, you, you were like a good 15 pounds of lean body mass smaller. Yeah. What Sal so? sizes everybody. At up. least yes. you look jacked right now. I think now. it's the shirt. No, it's I not, it's dude. The shirt. No, it's, it's not. You know I'm. Big, come on, get out of here. <laughs> you, uh, you 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 put on some serious muscle yeah. recently. It, what what are you um, doing differently? What's going on? Stuck at home for, for maps anabolic. Days. <laughs> um, I did I did the the Russian kettlebell cert. Mm-hmm. So I spent the first half of COVID training for that. So I did a ton of kettlebells. How'd you like that? A ton of, of overhead farmer's walks and snatches, Turkish get-ups. And I would just keep ordering heavier and heavier kettlebells. And that, that was I love it. And I want to do RKC too, but they keep moving it with the with the pandemic farther mm. in the future. So every time I get excited about the snatch test again, it just gets thrown a little bit farther down the road. You, and man. then I did um, uh, a lot of BFR training, a lot of BFR training, like three times a week, two failure, full body BFR training. Um, we, well, my kids actually got a lot of really good meat sponsors for their podcast, like Bel Campo and Butcher Box. And then, uh, this guy named, uh, Ty Lopez who partnered up with Joel Salatin. He's got a farm now. So they're sending my podcast meat for that. And so we, we We have a ton of meat. (laughs) We have a ton of organ meats. I started doing about 12 of those ancestral supplements, organ capsules, like Mm -hmm. heart, liver, kidney, um, what else? They got lung, they got brain, so a ton of liver. And uh, yeah, liver, organ meats, kettlebells, BFR training. And um, then I'm still doing a lot of BPC and TB500. Diana Ball. In between. Yeah, <laughs> Di- Diana Ball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did, yeah. C3PO? Did you, did it, does it feel like your body was uh, like craving to grow because it seemed like you just put it on? Do you feel like you were holding it back? And then, you know, and do you feel better with more muscle mass? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I was telling Adam, especially going into the winter when you don't want to be cold and frail and mm-hmm. weak. I don't want to be the first one that the wolves or the bears get. And uh, no, but, but in all seriousness, I, I like to maintain a little bit of extra muscle, but my all the guys in my family are so lean, it's hard. Mm. Like You do have to eat a lot. Really? And for me, probably with my one weak link, if I have one weak link, it's gut. I have to be careful when I'm eating a lot to really select my foods. You know, like we were talking about, I'm doing no FODMAPs, no legumes, no prebiotic fibers, very few probiotics. So I'm pretty much doing like meat, tubers, fish, bone broth, organ meats, um, you know, some berries, still doing a little bit of like a good clean protein powder with some colostrum and things like that in the mornings. But yeah, just a lot of, of nutrient dense, super clean food, but it is hard to eat a yeah. lot. I, I imagine you're similar. I mean, you have a similar bone structure, similar height. I would think that you have to be north of 4,500 calories to to maintain. Or yeah, I'm, I I think 4,500 for me right now would be tops. I think I'm going like 3,500 to 4,500. Well, 35 is not right bad. There. I found yeah. once I start getting the, over 4, this so. little lady next next to me right here, she just keeps shoving food <laughs> in my face, and I just I eat it like a good yeah. boy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't yeah. keep it coming. Well, you're both obviously a picture of health. I think you guys represent. Uh, mm-hmm. What you talk about, uh, pretty pretty darn well. So that's 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 pretty cool. Do you notice any changes in performance because with more muscle mass? Because you are you know you know most of the time I know I've known you 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 like to really do things like obstacle course racing, yeah. hanging off things and, and yeah. Is it make it more challenging because you're heavier, or does the strength offset that? Well, we were talking with the doctor this morning because uh, we're going over to a, a clinic after this to get just some some work done, and um, the doctor asked me well, what what hurts, and I pause him. To nothing. Like I, I feel great because, and you hit on something there. I'm not racing anymore, and mm-hmm. that's probably a big part. Of, that, that's a big part of the weight gain too. Yeah. Is mm-hmm. I went from running, you know, sometimes 20, 30 yeah, miles a week. I'm running right? maybe. Your body a break, so my right? running right now is when I go check the mail. I sometimes run up from the mailbox, so I'm running like a mile a week right now. And then we play a little bit of family tennis. We do family tennis usually a couple of nights a week, and so a lot less chronic cardio, a lot less running. I was even training for a triathlon last year, so a lot less swimming, a lot less cycling, and just basically a lot of kettlebell and a lot of BFR. Yeah, the thing about resistance training that I like so much and one of the reasons why I think it's the perfect uh, exercise prescription for the modern for modern life is that it's pro tissue whereas lots of cardiovascular activity tends to be uh, you know anti uh, tissue as your body tries to become more efficient and become better at this kind of long duration high oxidative stress type of activity resistance training done properly just for longevity not saying you shouldn't do any cardiovascular activity, but resistance training just it's better uh, for longevity. Uh, you just feel better. It's a totally different uh, I, feeling. I, I think. I think honestly, the as, as simple and and non complex as it sounds, I think lifting heavy weights 
walking a shit ton and then playing some sport that forces you to sprint every once in a while is just like that's that's the perfect match. Mm-hmm. I, I would, I, I, would I, think, I think that that's hit just hits just about everything from a physiological standpoint. I would 100% mm-hmm. agree. Back to the gut health thing, um, I've read studies that show that uh, athletes and hard training uh, individuals suffer from gut health issues at a much higher rate than uh, the average person, which kind of sounds contradictory, right? If you're a hard training person, you work out a lot, you're probably very health conscious. Really? You think it is? It's th- This well, is I, what the studies yeah, show. I, think I, it's- I, I can tell you what I think it is. And it's, and it's paradoxical because they have found, I believe it's the firmicoid to bacterioid ratio in elite athletes tends to be more favorably oriented towards metabolic efficiency, towards harnessing energy from mm. carbohydrates more efficiently. And there, there was even an outside magazine article, I think it was last year, about whether or not people would start getting fecal microbiota transplants from elite athletes, like get the same gut biota as an athlete. But the, the biome aside, we know, and we've known for a long time in exercise physiology, that gut permeability increases mm-hmm. when blood flow is directed away from the gut, all the more so during high intensity interval training, yes. all the more so during high intensity interval training or exercise in general in the heat. Right. And, th- and this is why even like back when I was racing Ironman years ago, I would always use colostrum. I would load with colostrum for a couple of weeks going into a race just because of the research that also shows that that limits that amount of gut permeability onset. To seal those junctions. Furthermore, I would not go near ibuprofen or Advil or any NSAID during a race or after because when you combine that increased gut permeability with something that's mildly toxic to the liver and the kidneys, it's a, it's a recipe. You, you essentially simulate rhabdo. With that type and then you combine that with probably uh, toxic shock, different eating behaviors too, right? When you're an athlete, you tend to like get down on meals mm-hmm. on a whole other level than somebody who's just well, a right. sedentary. And lifestyle. Sometimes you're you're eating when you still have blood flow right. directed to your extremities. Always, yeah. I mean, you're, you're encouraged to eat right after a workout, and if mm-hmm. you're you've got some systemic inflammation going on, which is going to happen, especially after an intense workout, and then on top of it, you're you're consuming a "Quote unquote easily digestible food like a shake, uh, which is you know you know it's 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 even more it's probably even more likely to pass through your 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 your, your gut than uh, solid foods. So that combination over time, I feel like is the perfect storm. I agree with your with your theory on that, but I didn't I do notice that if I because I'm sensitive to gut stuff, my I, my gut issues uh, it's something I'm always kind of dealing with when my training is through the roof." Um, is when I need to be the most careful. So yeah. it makes perfect well, sense. I think nearly every athlete should be on something that's going to alter the the opening of the, you know, that, that zonulin protein, the activity of that zonulin protein that makes the gut more permeable. So you know whether that is uh, colostrum or or lignite or, or anything like that that's going to help to keep that tight junction closed. I think that just about any athlete should be on a really good enzyme complex, especially for any fat mm. or protein rich meals. And Finally, they should have a, a giant slice of your sourdough bread, babe, every night with some <laughs> grass-fed butter, and salt, and honey on it. Mm, and, and, and that's that, the, that would solve yeah. all the world's woes. Now I'm assuming that. that that's real oh, sourdough. So it the, is. The gluten is uh, is all, I guess, out. Right? What happens no, with it, the, it's, through the process? It's somewhat out. It, yeah. it basically pre-digests the gluten. So gluten isn't gone. It's just gone through um, the starter and it eats the gluten and digests it. So when you eat it. You actually don't have to do all your stomach doesn't do all the hard work of breaking gluten down. It's already partially broken down. Now, how do you? How long a process? But if you, if you have celiac disease, you're, you're still going to paint the back of the toilet seat if you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, I would. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, no, so how long does it take to re- to make real sourdough at home? At least twenty four hours. Okay, so it's a it's mm-hmm. a process. Yeah, but it's mostly just waiting. Okay, it's okay. not yeah. that hard. People, I think. The hardest thing is keeping it alive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now, I, now what we what we what we talked about before you came on the show when you, when you had told us you'd be in the area, you had suggested it would be a good idea to do a podcast on parenthood and, and raising children. And I think you two. I thought I said guns, vaccines, and uh, <laughs> abortion, and, <Yeah>. and <laughs> abortion, <laughs> the, yeah. abortion, yeah. and the questionable uh, gender of track and field athletes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. those were the main <laughs> things we wanted to yeah, tackle. Yeah, yeah, let's let's <laughs> just <laughs> jump into each of those. Let's, yeah, let's lose yeah. everybody. Political yeah. affiliations. Yeah. 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 No. No. Let's no. No. There. No. We're talking about parenthood, and I think you both are two of the most interesting people on this particular topic. We've been to your house. 
Uh, Justin spent the night there, um, you know, a uh, while no, ago. No, I didn't, but I definitely oh, was you there. But you were there. had your delicious yeah. meals. So, yeah, and, it was and great. Yeah. You, you were both two of the most involved parents uh, that I've ever met with your children. You, you just, you're, you're involved and uh, almost every aspect of what's going you, on. You, you can call us helicopter yeah. parents. No, no. <laughs> I was just going to say. just don't want them to helicopter die, Helicopter and involved are yeah. very different. <laughs> exactly. you, you guys don't feel that way. Do you really? You don't feel like your helicopter no. parents, do you? Oh, okay. my gosh, no. I was going to say, I don't <laughs> feel like yeah. you. If anything, anti-helicopter. Yeah, parents. I don't think yeah. you No, what like I mean by involved right. is you're literally present and involved. It's You know, your kids aren't just good. You know, you're, you're, you're present. You're involved with the whole process. Definitely not helicopter. I see your kids having a lot of freedom to fail and to succeed kind of, you know, on their own. So I think you guys are, are great people to talk to. Plus you guys homeschool, which I think is an interesting topic. I know right now homeschooling is exploding. Oh yeah. It's the fastest it it growth. It sounds like the best way to do it right now. Yeah. Well, and Ben grew up when it wasn't cool. I grew up when homeschooling wasn't <laughs> when it cool. Was like, You're ahead of your time. I wish I could hit the yeah. rewind button because that would be so cool right now. <laughs> and I was homeschooled in the traditional manner. You buy curriculum, you know, back when I was homeschooled, it was the Saxon math curriculum or the Usborne books or any number of, of different, you know, a Becca was another very popular curriculum and you'd order typically in many cases the, the same books from the same organization. So you had your, your math, your reading, your writing, your logic, your grammar, your social studies, whatever. And you'd order that all from Usborne or from a Becca or from Saxon or from any of these folks who would then send all the books to your house. Kind of like when you start a semester in college and you, mm. get, you go to the bookstore and get all your books and then you'd, you know, you go through lessons plan, lesson plans with mom and sit around the kitchen table and, you know, everybody, you know, meet at the kitchen table at eight and we go through all the books and occasionally there's some kind of a group activity with other homeschoolers in the afternoon. Very, very traditional dyed in the wool homeschooling scenario. And that is not what we do with our kids. Really? At all. I so. want to, I want to start there actually. Um, you know, I feel like, We've gotten to know each other really well in the last, what has it been, three, almost four years? It's been four years? It's been four years. Four least. years. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I consider you a, a good friend of ours. And I'd say that the thing that I probably know the least about is really your your childhood and, like, your upbringing. Um, I feel like I've gotten pieces of it through, uh, through the years. But I'd really like to, like, dive into that, um, your relationship with your parents, what it was like when you were a kid. Um, and that I think will, well, that has such a strong influence on how you parent. I think that's it a has, great place it has to start. influence, not only in the way you parent, but also in the way you partner. Jess and I have even been, uh, digging into this a little bit in terms of our relationship and the attachment theory in terms of, of whether you were given a lot of attention when you were young, in terms of whether you were left to fend for yourself, in terms of how Explain much the you theory. had to. So I'm not very good at explaining attachment theory. I'm going to totally bastardize it. But <laughs> essentially, some people are born and grow up with uh, anxious attachment where they really look to other people for verification, for compliments, for words of affirmation, mm -hmm. and for things that make them feel as though they're, they're okay. They don't have to be yeah. anxious about approval. anything. You know, yeah. mom and dad are giving them verbal approval and saying, good job, you know, and they, and they grow up really digging that kind of approval and almost needing it and still needing it from a partner when, when, you know, they're, they're married or they're with a partner. And then there's, there's another one that's, that's more of like, um, it, it's almost the opposite of attachment. It's, do you remember what it's called, babe? It's, or the opposite Avoid. of anxiety. Avoidance. Yeah. So avoidance yeah. would be, I want to be left alone. I was, oh, you know, I, I was maybe left to be very independent and I love my independence and I want my independence and I don't want a partner who's in my face all the time. And I'm very self-sufficient and independent. And that person would not necessarily be the person who needs as many words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this whole idea of the five love languages, you know, love words of book. affirmation or mm -hmm. quality time or gifts or certain things that really mean a lot to your partner when you express those to your partner. And, you know, for example, I, I kind of skew a little bit towards anxiety attachment and Jessica kind of skews a little bit towards avoidance attachment. Mm. And so in our relationship, one thing that I found myself doing for years was I'd worry if she was okay. Mm. Right. Like when, when I'm making coffee in the kitchen, I look up and she's in the kitchen and I, I can't quite tell if she's smiling or if she looks like she got up and she's in a good mood. I'll be like, you okay, babe? And she's like, yeah, I'm okay. You should. Sure, I can't. You, sh you sure you're okay? And, and by the end of the morning, I want to cut oh, you. And by the end of the morning, Jess is like, "I'm okay, damn it!" And um, and 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 for me, what we've realized is that because my love language is uh, words of affirmation, if Jess wakes up and and she says something like, um, 
gosh, I'm still thinking about how great that steak was that you cooked last night. Mm. Or, um, you know, that coffee smells amazing. You make such good coffee you know, or, or something like that. Like I have, I feel zero need to ask her if she's okay. Mm. Like it's like, that's all me projecting me on her. So oh, it's, interesting. It's, it's really interesting. And, and so kind of a rabbit hole from what you were saying about how the way that you are raised affects the way that you parent. Mm-hmm. You know, it also affects the way that you interact with your, with your spouse to a certain extent. Now, how were you ra- How do you think the way you were raised made you skew towards that, that, that type of attachment? Um, you know, I, I was, I was kind of noodling on this cause I'm, you know, my, my mom, I really depended on her for approval. I really looked to her for you're, you're doing a good job. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're good, you're great. And gosh, darn it, people like you. And, and I think that I looked to her a lot for compliments. And so I still grew up looking to women in my life, such mm. as my wife for those same type of compliments yet I married someone who's very like tomboyish, more, more of the avoidance there, who's, who's wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily think of unless we had a conversation about it. Oh, like compliment this person. Cause for her, and we were talking about this, it, it, it almost feels like you it feels, were like um, unauthentic, like, inauthentic. like, and that sounds terrible, but I'm right. like, I, I just don't like compliments do not come to my mind at all. Like, I mean, it's not that I'm like, I don't think it, it's just I don't yeah. voicing it just feels weird to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and plus the fact that Jess and I met in well, we met in second grade Sunday school, but we we really got to know each other well in college, and we're very competitive. We did triathlon. She raced track and field. So we, we've we've uh, you know sand volleyball everything. We've we've always been a very competitive couple, and so part of it too is like when she compliments me, it's it's almost like it 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 rubs against our our innate tendency to compete with one each other with, with one another and yeah. to try and try and one up each other unless she like beats you right and she's like you did a good job yeah. oh yeah oh yeah like, like <laughs> Honey, me, that was your best I'm, effort. I'm wired up i'm yeah. wired up to be an achiever your like, red ribbon. Like, you know, if i take a personality <laughs> profile I'm, I'm achiever perfectionist and jessa is more people pleaser type b and you know one of, one of the ways that i'll compete with her is if i see her out in the porch drinking a glass of wine just like you know lounging at whatever 6 p.m and i i come up and it's like an hour before dinner or whatever and i see her out there you know i i will literally say well i've got about an hour of work still and about 30 <laughs> emails i still gotta finish so i'll be up from the office in about an hour so i'll see you then i'm gonna go get some work done yeah. and like i'll i'll, I'll literally <laughs> like find myself <laughs> doing right? things like that <laughs> Just because we're still competitive with each other. So you um, guys are actually the reverse of Katrina and I, very, very similar. So I could totally relate to the feeling unauthentic to just say compliments to say them. Mm-hmm. So I actually, and I love uh, the five love languages. I, I recommend that to anybody in a relationship. Mm-hmm. I think it, it brought so much insight to Katrina and I and, and how we navigate. We've been together for 10 years. So of course, we've learned a ton about each other. And I, I can never, uh, I can never compliment enough um, for her. And so I'm always trying to practice things that feel authentic and real. That uh, that it provides that for her. Something that I've done that's that's helped that is I just make a point. Um, I try and do this at least once a month where I get her flowers and like write a card. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I have, to, if I sit and, and down, is that her language is, is receiving a gift? Uh, actually gifts aren't uh, affirmation. It's okay. the card that really okay. matters. The flowers the is flowers like, just a message. Bonus. On the yeah. Card. The flowers is a bonus. She likes them in the house and they're pretty. Uh, the card is what means everything to her. She, and she would rather, and this was hard for me when we first started dating, I was the shower with gifts because that's my mm-hmm. thing. So I mean, bought her all these nice clothes right. all the time because right. because the way that you thought was well, of, of course, of course, she's going to love to get gifts. I love to get gifts. Exactly. She's got to yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really so that, interesting. Yeah. That's not the language your partner speaks. No, and, and I actually think this is like one of the biggest things where people miss in their relationship because and it and, and no one is really guilty because you feel like you're trying. I remember when we had that that this first you know paradigm shattering moment in our relationship because. She had felt like um, I wasn't giving her that love, and I, I remember like going. Literally last week, I just dropped like five hundred dollars on new Lulu yeah. outfits. Like, I can pull the yeah. receipt, right? And I'm thinking to myself, like, <laughs> I, you know, I stopped in my day. I thought about her. I went and bought her all this stuff, and I brought it home for no reason, no holiday. Like, how is that not showing love? But it took me a while to make that connection that I could do that all day long, and she still not feel loved because I'm constantly speaking my language and not hers. Mm-hmm. And now, I, now I, Ben, I think go ahead. Uh, uh, one thing that comes to mind, I realize I haven't even answered your question about my my childhood yet so but one thing that comes to mind regarding that whole idea of gifts as being a language of love is i also think that that can lead to a certain form of lazy parenting 
meaning mm. that you know in many cases we feel as though we're doing a good job as parents if we you know take our kids to some expensive steakhouse sure. and then you know the next day a, a trip to the zoo an arcade and a movie and we, we just try and t make every moment epic or every moment mm -hmm. extremely extremely valuable mm -hmm. with cash with money when in fact i think that time and traditions trump that big time, oh, big time. like like i i can tell you like if, if you have breakfast for dinner on Tuesday night where dad makes eggs and waffles every Tuesday night for, you know, eight years of their childhood, they're going to remember that more than any, you know, random trip to Vegas where, you know, mm -hmm. you blew a thousand dollars on the whole family at dinner at a Japanese restaurant. Mm -hmm. Or if, if they've got every single Christmas, you know, they're, they're doing the 24 day advent calendar and getting a little chocolate and, you know, and, and doing a little bit of reading each morning, you know, for those 24 days, building and building and building to Christmas every single year. When they grow up and you ask them about Christmas, they're probably going to talk about that tradition and like that, that memorable habit that's a part of, you know, of the, the, the family. Then they will that one year they got the Huffy, you know, the shiny Huffy bike that they'd always wanted. You know, oh, and, I found and, that with my kids, just building things with them was everything like, it, you know, taking them to, uh, like I knew my son was into tetherball. And so we just like his gift for Christmas was all of us were going to put this together and like make it from scratch and everything. And then, you know, their, their bike ramp and all this, just that vested time that everybody shares together. It makes that thing more valuable to them. It has, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of relevance yeah. and we all it, had an experience it, we shared together. It doesn't, if that time is repeated and regularly scheduled, I think that's where you start to build families and legacies and even this concept that grandparents matter because they become part of passing on those stories totally. and traditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that having family, family rituals, and that's a huge part of our parenting, like our family dinners, are the, you know, the, the song we sing before Sunday dinner, the, the type of journaling we do in the morning, the type of journaling we do in the evening as a family, the, you know, the bedtime music, the trips to the tennis court, the, the, six different card games that we play nearly every night of the week. Like our, our kids find dependency and trust and safety in that. But furthermore, we're not raising our children. We're raising our grandchildren. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not raising our children, we're raising our grandchildren. And the type of traditions that yeah. we instill in our children now, those are the things that go on and become a special, dependable part of family, no, no matter where. You know, if I, if I get uprooted and I got to move to a new state and get a new job or whatever, they can we, count we, on can, that we can still play mm -hmm. our Sunday night tennis. Yep. Right. Still... Did you both get that growing up? I got a lot of that growing up. She did. I've, I've learned everything about the value of tradition from my wife because my family was very, my family was, you know, Christmas morning. What, what do you guys want to do for dinner tonight? Should we get some Subway sandwiches or, you know, Find a, find a turkey that we forgot to pull out of the freezer to no, thaw or whatever. Because of that, were you, uh, was that just normal to you and it wasn't a big deal? Or did you ever go through a phase where you had animosity towards your parents because of maybe how you were raised? So, um, pleasantly uh, agnostic. Like I just, I didn't even know right. how you're big. You're normal. Until I met Jessa and I thought it was super weird. Yeah, most people weird. think my- She's like, oh, we got our annual trip to the coast. We do it at this time every single year. I'm like, annual trip? Like you actually do the same place every year? Or, 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 or you know, this, this, yeah. this is the color of the plates that we use on Christmas. And these are, this is what the name yeah, tags look like for Thanksgiving. Use. And this is the exact Easter egg hunt that we do every East. And for me, it Did, was Now you push super, back against that? I didn't push back against it, but it was just super weird for me. Like yeah. I never, and, and oh my goodness, like I think pinch, it's weird pinch me now. I got so people. lucky, you know, marrying a girl who, who actually knew about the importance of traditions. Cause our kids are the, like, they're so stable at home cause they, there's so much they can depend on mm -hmm. every day of the week, you know, predictable, uh, uh environments remove a lot of fear and anxiety. So I want to hear from Justin because yeah. when you have uh, when you have the difference like this and I know Katrina and I have this there's there's always some sort of resistance somewhere. What has been the greatest challenge for you with him because of the way he was raised that you guys have had to work through together? You know, it wasn't like the like doing the same thing at Christmas or, you know, Easter or whatever or having those traditions around certain holidays. It was honestly more of the tradition in the daily routines oh yeah because like 
I grew up in a family. My dad, he was a farmer. He raised cattle. He came home at 5 o'clock every night. We had dinner at 6 o'clock. Everybody came together. And then we enjoyed maybe a half-hour TV show with popcorn. You know, there was always tradition built in to the day. Mm. And so for a very, very long... <laughs> and she married me where I'm, I'm like, I'm on a, a plane to Abu Dhabi to race a triathlon. I'm yeah. back working, you know, 10 to noon, 3 to 5, uh, 8 to 11 p.m. at a gym and then, you know, coming home, trying to build an online business till 2 a.m. And it was just all over the map because I grew up with a dad who literally would hold the same job for like a year and then go start a new company and then sell that and hmm. like buy a franchise and then, you know, go and, and buy some old ambulances and, and start to do, hmm. you know, ambulancing. It, it, like my dad was all over the map. So she grew up in a very dependable, traditional, consistent you know, farmer yeah. type of environment, whereas I grew up with, with you know, a dad who was just all over the, the map in terms of entrepreneurship. Mm -mm. So that, that was a, that was a different, cause I, I could, I could see how the annual traditions is like, where Ben- That's understandable. Yeah. Ben can be like, yeah, yeah okay, fine. Well, we'll do this. Right. The day to day had it been like hard. Every day it's like, this is what we do in the morning. This is what we do right. at night. This is what yeah. we do it. Yeah. I could see how that would be, you know, kind It took of me a long time. And now like I can, like the day does not feel right unless we have our family dinner with our card game, with me mm -hmm. playing ukulele or guitar to the boys afterwards, with our, you know, we do self-examination and, uh, and purpose at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, we say in our journals, what good have I done today and what could I have done better today? So we learn mm -hmm. from both our successes and our failures mm -hmm. and what is one way that I lived out my life's purpose because we, I've, I've taught my children from a very early age to have a strong purpose statement, you know, to have their ikigai, to have their, their plan de vida, the thing that rips them out mm -hmm. of bed in the morning, that gives them a lens through which they see a lot of the, the boxes that they might be checking during the day. You know, in the, in the end, ultimately, how is this helping you to fulfill your purpose? And then in the morning, same thing. We, you know, we, we, right now we meet as a family out in the sun on the deck. We've got a, a, a five-minute meditation app that we go through called Abide that walks us through like a little verse from scripture and a prayer. Then we all write down one thing we're grateful for and one person who we can pray for or help that day. And, and all these little things, they rubbed me the wrong way at first. I, I just, to me, it felt like being just like an old fuddy-duddy TV show family from the you know 50s or whatever, like Leave it to Beaver. And now- like it, it, it is the most magical part of the day. These little traditions. They ever request any specific uh, songs from you now, like some ACDC or anything? <laughs> yeah, they they, they they know a little bit of the playlist, but they're 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 really into epic movie soundtracks, which I can't yeah. play. Oh, wow. Yeah, but uh, Wayne Norton too. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, he works I, out I, to that. Yeah. I took him into the into a recording studio for our Christmas gift for mom, and they really like the Greatest Showman, which has a lot of really epic. Oh, right, right, so right. We, we recorded a whole album for mom yeah. in a recording studio, and then which they they right. also really like um like super heartfelt like praise and worship songs. So, oh, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're mm -hmm. very they're they're very into like praise and worship. So. So they usually like that kind of stuff, or sometimes like just like an old school hymn, like yeah. Amazing Grace. Well, so like so that. I'm listening to all this. And by the way, nice. it sounds it sounds amazing. Um, and you know, speaking to tr to these 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 rituals or traditions, this is how cultures are created. Absolutely. And you know, one thing about um, about humans is when you look at things that last for thousands and thousands of years, that's because we've found significant value, and otherwise it wouldn't last, right? This is part of evolution. You know, people who are into science, who understand evolution from a biological sense, you also need to understand evolution from a cultural and practical sense and behaviors and practices and cultures. We often take them for granted because they've been around for thousands of years and we tend to look at them and be like, well, that's stupid. Why do we have to do it that way? Everybody's been doing it so long. It's a, it may, maybe we even view it as oppressive or whatever, but the reality is it exists because humans have found it tremendously valuable and oftentimes in ways that you don't even fully understand because it's been around for so long. But as I'm listening to this, and I think, again, what you guys are doing is extremely valuable. I also know that you have two 12 year old boys. They're mm -hmm. about to become teenagers yeah. <laughs> and like all kids, uh, I'm sure they give some pushback sometimes. I mean, I don't think there's any perfect person out there, let alone perfect kid. What do you do when your kid says, I don't want to do this. Or what, is, or what is it yeah. that they give yeah, pushback? Yeah, yeah, like, how do you handle that? Well, first of all, and I think maybe it was when we recorded in Tahoe, we talked a little bit about, on, on one of the previous podcasts that we recorded together, 
about this idea of love and logic style parenting, yeah. educating your children on the consequences of their decision, then as much as possible, allowing them to make the decision, am I going to eat gluten? Am I going to, you know, look at pornography? Am I going to, you know, smoke a cigarette? You know, any of these things, you teach your children about the impact on the brain, the impact on the body, the potential societal implications, and then you let them make the decision and deal with the consequences, right? Maybe you know, poor performance at school the next day because they punished, you know, three cupcakes at their friend's birthday party. I'd rather them learn that way than me say no cupcakes and then feel like- I actually took a whole course. It's, it, there's, they have a free course right now online, Love and Logic. And the, the one of the things that they say on there that's so powerful. So they give the example. Here's an easy example. You're going out, you're going out somewhere, it's cold. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you tell your kid, hey, make sure you grab your jacket. I don't want to wear a jacket, right? So the, the old school way would be like, get your jacket, put it on. You're going to, mm -hmm. the love and logic way would be like, okay, don't worry. And then when you go out and they're freezing and there's, oh my God, it's cold. You empathize with them. Like, Gosh, oh, I know. Right. Yeah, that really <laughs> sucks or whatever. It is cold. And, and they cold. learn from that. And the, the way that they sell it, which I think is brilliant, is if, you, if they learn those lessons now, then they don't learn, they don't have to learn the hard way later on when it's like getting drunk driving or, you know, things that have real serious consequences. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I and, you, and take the course. I really think it's valuable. Uh, it is. And, and there are there are two other considerations here with, with this style of parenting. A, it only works if you're a really good example. Right. You, you mm -hmm. can't you can't ex you can't tell your kids, oh, you can use the phone and the television and the video game platform as much as you'd like. You know, it might hurt your eyes a little bit. You might not sleep that well tonight. But if you say that, and then every night after work, you're plopped in front of Netflix for two hours, mm -hmm. then that's what your kids are going to have as a good, like in the Greenfield house, if there's downtime, 90% of the time I'm holding a musical instrument or I have a book in my face, mm. right? I am not on my phone. I'm not playing a video game. I'm not parked in front of a screen. So when my kids have downtime, like their go-to thought pattern is not, where's my eye touch? Or I'm going to go, go hunt down some Got videos it. on YouTube yeah. on the MacBook. Then the other thing, and, and this is new for me, is that- I think that sometimes that style of parenting can lead almost too much to you wanting your kids to like you, you know, or as Jordan Peterson would say, don't do things that would make your kids dislike you or don't do things that would make your kids hate you. Sometimes I think we can take that in, in too far the opposite sure. direction. Mm -hmm. I don't want my child to ever feel as though they were deprived or as they, as though I told them they had to do something. Cause we use this whole love and logic. Don't ever make your kids angry type of approach. Uh, but, um, you know, for example, um, you know, I have decided that even though for the longest time I've been writing out little workouts for River and Terran to do, you know, so you guys got to do 60 pound pet sandbag one time around the obstacle course and, and you, know, you do this three times this week or your mm -hmm. workout today is five goblet squats, five push ups, you know, dead hang for max time. And you're going to do five rounds of that. Mm -hmm. um, I was not being a good father. I was not being a good leader. I was not being a good king in terms of basically me almost parenting through check boxes and, and giving my kids little assignments that they could or could not do, but great if you've done it versus me literally bringing them out with me and sacrificing, you know, my time. podcast time or audiobook time or my favorite Spotify artist time to just go inside my own head for a workout and instead take them with me and have them suffer in a way that they kind of sort of don't want to suffer. You can tell along with me because let's face it. I think a 5 a.m. paper route like I had when I was a kid, like if my parents would have told me that, oh, you could or could not do that, it's up to you. But because they said you need a job and we have a paper job, so go mm -hmm. work, make money. I think that's character building. And so I think that you sometimes have to get to a point where you are telling you, you're putting your foot down, you're saying, yo, this is going to be good for you. Let's go out to the garage. We're going to sweat for a half hour. It's not, it's not, do you want to come with me? Mm -hmm. It's we're going out. We're, well, we're, we're going and out. also it's just, coming alongside your kid and doing something with them rather yeah, than telling. yeah that versus telling them because it's not you're you're sacrificing your time which is a, a display of love towards that person and so really i think in all of this love has to be seen in everything that you do for your yeah. child because they won't have trust for you if you aren't displaying that to them regularly right yeah. and right, that's right. that's in putting them to bed and not just saying good night see you in the morning it's putting them to bed you know, making sure they have everything they need. And maybe they need that prayer or that song that or that ritual. Oh my gosh. It's it's literally just so like good. taking taking your time and giving to them. I a hundred percent agree. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when your kid like do you have an example of time when you, your when your boys was like, I, I don't want to do that journaling today. We're not gonna do it or you don't, I don't care about that right now or whatever. You I, know I don't feel like I've ever 
and this sounds crazy to Paul people. I we have don't receive a lot of pushback from our boys in that way. Yeah. I haven't seen that. No, we don't. I mean, they're, they're not they're not perfect. Like like you know because they are. They're unschooling. They each have their own little MacBook, and sometimes they'll have, you know, like they they take one course called Mathnasium, where they have an online math tutor, and sometimes they've got little homework assignments. And you know, I was finding with increasing frequency, I walk into them, and you could tell they were switching browser yeah. windows really fast <laughs> to, to like <laughs> show that they were, they were on task. <laughs> and where where my mind goes is. I can tell them, hey, you're you're hiding something from dad and taking your computer away from a week. You're grounded. Right? But what I said to both of them in two separate conversations, because sometimes you want to be careful not to embarrass one kid in front of the other or yeah. to mm-hmm. make one feel like you know they're wrong and the other's right. So I I took them aside and I said, look, I'm not stupid. I can tell when I walk into the room when you're on your computer and you're quickly switching browser windows that you're doing something that you feel might not be the best use of your time or that I might disapprove of. I told them, look, I don't care. It's your time. It's your life. It's up to you whether whether or not you want to waste your life or, or squander your education or spend time on some silly cartoon website versus applying yourself and doing what it is that's going to make you a better person in the moment. But my one request is that you not hide it from me. You don't have to be embarrassed. If, if you have a certain website you're visiting that you want to visit, go for it. Do it. Just don't feel like you have to hide it from me because you're not going to get in trouble all you're doing is, is you're ruining your own life and that's up to you. Just please don't hide it from me. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so those are the type of conversations. It's like, that fuck, we'll cartoon, cartoon Network is ruining my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so the, here's the other thing too that sometimes I worry about. Um, now, my, my son is about to turn 15. My daughter's 10. So, you know, kind of close in age to your boys. And obviously, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fitness and health person, right? And I've seen this before. I've seen this before where you know, I had a, a family member whose dad was a, an herbalist and super into health and whatnot, and the, and the kids had to eat everything was healthy. They didn't get all the processed foods that everybody got. And every, you know, when it was their birthday, they didn't get the normal cake. They got the, you know, the, the, the super crunchy, you know, whatever cake with no sugar. And what ended up happening to both of them is the second they got out of the house, they went Revolted. super so far. I'm cracking up right now. Just thinking about like yeah, Sal's I, kids I have like this, a rye cracker yeah. for their birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they went super like far cake? in the opposite direction. And so sometimes I get, or, or I've also seen where parents are super into fitness to where the kid uh, maybe feels like it's a bit tyrannical. And so they, they have this bad relationship with fitness. And then when they get out of the house and they're on their own, I never want to work out type of deal. Do, what, what do you do to ensure that either that doesn't happen or if it does happen, that they end up coming back to you know, the right thing. Well, I don't know. This, here's my feelings on that is my own personal journey myself is my parents didn't force fitness or food or anything on me, really. And I was allowed to come to that at my own time. Now, I think my parents instilled in me like an understanding of this is good for you. This is not good for you. You should maybe be active and not sedentary. You know, they instilled those virtues in me, but they didn't force them upon me. And so I I, I call it, we're not raising dogs, we're raising spiritual beings. Mm. You know, you're not raising your kids to do this and obey and this and that. You're raising them to make, to have a spirit and be able to make a decision and, and, and have virtue. And so to me, I really feel that and if you are teaching your kid anything, if it's not done in the heart of love and they don't understand that you love them and that's why you're teaching this to them is because you care about them, then it's going to have – it's going to f- kind of hit tin and just bounce yeah. off. Mm. I think I think the the independence that comes with adolescence, which we're, of course, increasingly going to experience as, as, as our kids you know, grow into teenagerhood, dictates that a child will want to do the opposite of what their parent is doing to assert their own independence. Sure. That's just the way – that things are. And so I fully expect and I'm fully prepared for River and Terran to be the anti gym rat or the person who prides himself upon maybe having a little bit of pooch and being a member of the chess club and playing a lot of piano just because dad is so into fitness. And I want to like, yeah. that's not cool. Right. Yeah. Right? Not, not that I'm yeah. saying that adolescence, I, I, I think sometimes it's used as a crutch for or, or an excuse to go into full rebellion. But I think some amount of, of, asserting one's independence and sometimes asserting one's independence by trying to do the opposite of what their parent may have done is understandable. But for me personally, like I think that you always kind of experience that prodigal son esque moment mm-hmm. where, mm. where you, where you come back and you realize the value. Like my dad used to give me books that I absolutely did not want to read. I mean, mm-hmm. like 
Christian apologetics and you know sermons by C.S. Lewis, and just all this this stuff. I was just like, why do I want to read this? Just like you know, you know, the way I think about it when I was a teenager, Jesus freak drivel, and you know, mm-hmm. just this this random religious philosophy. Like I want to be reading about. You know, like I, I loved fantasy fiction and I loved space fiction. I got, that's the kind of stuff I wanted to read. But now coming full circle, like when I've got downtime and I feel like I really want to feed my spirit and feed my soul and challenge myself intellectually. I mean, that's what I'm reading. I'm reading you know, John Piper and C.S. Lewis and Doug Wilson and all these mm-hmm. these deep, logical, philosophical books on religious, uh, on, on, on religion or on apologetics. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, geez, I'm doing exactly what my dad <laughs> my did. Dad like, all it took me, <laughs> took me 30 years to see the value in that. But, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm actually, I'm growing my spiritual muscles mm-hmm. now. I yeah, understand but you came what to dad that was place. about. Yeah, but I came to that place. So I think you show your kids what's important. You. And then at a certain point you just... You, know, you trust God that that they're going to if you've if you've exposed them to the right type of things eventually make the right decisions even though they'll probably go in through that independence. Got to be the yes. hardest thing to do it's as a modeling. parent. That's got to be the oh, hardest yeah. thing because you you know what they're going to do. You see the pitfalls and you just got to let them do it. And that yeah. is really yeah. really hard. Yeah, but you know what's really cool is I've seen my parents go through that and see their daughter take really hard nose dives and do really stupid crap. How did you rebel? <laughs> Jess or Rebel? Yeah. I wasn't really. I. I can't. I like to teeter on the edge, but she, I never honestly, fully she plunged. Re- she rebelled by marrying me. Yeah, I basically <laughs> did. <laughs> did any of your guys now? Did any of your guys have siblings that rebelled or went the complete opposite? Like, did you guys? Oh, yeah, I think I'm, I would imagine I'm, everybody's got a little bit of a black. There's sheep. a black sheep in every family, in family. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But but what I what I was saying is, I'm like, I got to witness my parents walk through that mm. and go through the fire of that. I lived through that with them, and so to see their how they reacted to that and how they walked through that, it was just honestly with a lot of faith and a lot of prayer, and that's all you can do at that point because they are their own person, and at some point you do have to let them. You gotta let him go and just, you know. Yeah. You, well, you, got, you gotta let him go. Rest but, and promises, basically. Here, here's what I think, and here's why I think that idea, like whatever they say, ninety nine percent of the time you're gonna spend with your child is done with by the time they're eighteen. So mm-hmm. you better just make every minute count and you know live live every moment with your kid as if you're gonna be in your deathbed that night. And you know, everything exhausting. everything has to be epic. <laughs> and um, you know, I I think that that's a fl- it's based on a flawed theory. If you have built up traditions, if you have built up rituals, if you have built up an environment where parents are honored and grandparents are honored and and children are honored, then you create a scenario where you know when your kids are eighteen, they want to keep coming back for more. When they've when they've flown the nest and they've started their own family, they still want to keep coming back to their original family or including their parents and their extended family in their rituals and routines and mm-hmm. traditions because the entire family is built upon these deep rooted mm-hmm. traditions, and so. You know, I, I think that even though a lot of kids are going to have times when they go their own way, you, our job as parents is to create this safe nest full of traditions and habits and rituals and routines and dependency and trust that just makes them want to keep coming back for mm, more yeah. as they age and then take you when you're old as a parent into their home. Because I, I think that's mm-hmm. that's another big issue with parenting and with the value of parents and with the honor of being a father and a mother right now in culture is A, we hide away old people. Right? We hide, hide away old people because we don't want to care for them. We don't mm-hmm. want to give them the time. We yep. don't want to give the attention. And then, and I mean, th- this is probably, uh, this, this probably delves into the politics that I know you guys love to talk about so much. <laughs> We kill a whole bunch of little people, every mm. year. like yeah, what forty million of them, mm-hmm. right? And so when we say, okay, we care about babies, but you know, there's there's several tens of millions that were that we're willing to kill for convenience's sake each year, and then we care about parents, but when they get old and it's inconvenient, you gotta like change their diaper and they stink a little bit, we're gonna hide them away, right? So I think on both ends of the spectrum, there are some issues that cause us to a certain extent to devalue parents, well, devalue children. Well, there's one. I'll 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 move away from the 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 third rail there a little bit, but I'll move to one that's a little bit uh, much less of a third rail, but sometimes is also. I think is a big one is that I think fatherhood has been totally devalued uh, in, in, in yes. modern yep. societies. I, we just had this conversation. We yeah, did. You, can, <laughs> you Look, you watch TV shows and how they display the father. Oh, gosh, is, mo- modern family, right? Yeah, he's an mm, idiot. Yeah. He's a bumbling whatever. He doesn't really do much. He has no Mary value. He's, he's like the jester. He, he's, he's a clown. And yep. 
and it, so so here's what I think the problem is. And we run into a lot of this, like in the health space, anti-aging, mm-hmm. longevity, Peter Pan syndrome, right? Yeah. Like I'm, oh, yeah. I'm going to be a boy and have fun and go to, you know, Never like, like, like for me, I'm right. going to go, go to Spartan races and, and triathlons and, and get the, you know, stem cell injections in my dick and do all this like cowboy <laughs> Peter Pan. I'm going to be a boy forever yeah. type of shit. When in fact... Living like that, having all the biohacking toys, having the workouts, you know, being being the buddy because you really want your kids to like you and, and the clown and the jester. Not that there can't be some light, playful aspect to being a father, mm-hmm. but I think too many dads are not freaking like kings, true leaders, fathers, mm-hmm. strong rocks that the family can depend upon. And, you know, another part of that too is, is just, you know, welfare parenting, right? So mm. many single parent households with mothers, government steps in and takes the role of the father. So, so dads, a lot of times they don't even need to be a dad, right? Because somebody else is going to yeah. care for well, the family. In, in a lot of, the, a lot of boys running around. Yeah. And a lot, <laughs> in a lot of the old, you know, cultures, I talked earlier about how things exist for thousands of years, oftentimes, cause we find lots of value. When you go to the, a lot of these old cultures, um, it's a... It's almost like a way to brag when you're a father with a lot of kids. Like when men talk to each other, say, how many kids do you have? I have three kids. Well, I have four. Like, wow, you know, that's awesome, whatever. It's the opposite in our culture. If you are, you know, you tell a, guy, a buddy of yours that you have three kids and they'll they'll respond with like, oh, oh God, that's that sucks. Bummer. Yeah, well, well I'm going to, you know, Sorry, I, I got my, yeah. my Corvette and, you know, I get to yeah. bang hot chicks all the time and that sucks that you have to, you know, do that kind of stuff and they laugh about it or whatever. It's crazy that we don't, prize that anymore. And by the way, you can disagree all you want. The statistics are clear. They're crystal clear. Children raised without fathers are many, many times more likely to end up in all the terrible situations, everything from prison to drug abuse to suicide. We are in a, there's, it's like a pandemic of fatherless societies. It, it's yeah. really, really it sad. And, 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 and this, this comes because you were asking about my childhood. My father was somewhat absent meaning he, he was not a very high quality time, you know, lots of hugs type of dad. He, you know, he was off running businesses, starting businesses, very, he's naturally quiet, naturally introspective, naturally good at being an introvert and, you know, kind of off doing his own thing. Like I tend to be pulled towards his father was the same way, right? Always locked away in the office, always working or using work as an escape. So coming down to me and this idea of you're not raising your children, you're raising your grandchildren. I have come to the realization a very strong way over the past year or so that if I don't break that cycle, mm-hmm. if I continue to, you know, parent through check boxes, whatever, you know, River and Terry, here's your workout, is this, is that dad's headed out to LA for eight days, I'll be back and check in on you guys and make sure everything's, you know, going well. And if I am if I am not a fully present father, if I am not a leader, if I'm not the king of my household, then it's it, it's going to show my children the example of the father that a Greenfield father is. And then they go forth and do probably something very similar to what I did. Marry a really strong woman, you know, because Jess is an amazingly strong woman. She's super, you know, independent, self-sufficient, even a little bit of that avoidance syndrome versus the attachment syndrome that I have. So she can operate on her own just fine. And it's very easy for me to let her wear the pants in the family, to let her be the leader. And so I can be a little boy, you know, off, you know, pulling on a Speedo to go Mm. swim in Hawaii in a triathlon. Well, she's at home holding down the fort. And, you know, the question I've increasingly been asking myself is, is that what a Greenfield father should be known for? Should a Mm. Greenfield father be known for being the playful little boy off having great adventures, married to a really strong woman, so the kids are taken care of at home? Or should a Greenfield father be a leader, be a king, be someone who really takes their children under their wings and trains them and spends quality time with them and mm-hmm. sometimes has them suffer along with him and really, really teaches them how to be a man. And I would say that I think the, the latter is far more valuable than your kids liking you because you're just like the clown around the house. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a very yeah. powerful realization. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, have you found moments recently where you, you were about to take off and go do something and then you stopped yourself and you go, canceled your flight or canceled your trip and said, I'm staying home. I mean, have you, have you had moments like that in this last year where, cause you're right. When you have something so deep that it's generations, your father, your grandfather, that, that shit's so deeply rooted that that's hard always going to be default for you. It's hard to be aware of. And I, I'm, a, I had the same similar type of thing is to go bury myself into work. And so I have to always kind of check back in. Like, 
is this me kind of running away without even realizing I'm running away? And, you know, can I pass on this? Do you, you- I didn't have to cancel anything because, because God bless COVID that did it all for <laughs> yeah. me. Uh, but but <laughs> what, what I have that. done, one big change I have made is, um, and this has been really remarkable in the way it's just transformed my whole week, my approach to work, my approach to productivity, my approach to procrastination, my approach to prioritization is Sundays are full on family day. Mm. Me, no mm. calls, no, no work, no, oh, you know, we missed a call on Monday. Let's just shove this one into Sunday. You got time yeah. this weekend. I'll ping you this week. And I would find myself sometimes on Sunday, you know, three or four phone calls, playing some catch up work, you know, just getting things done. Sure. Now, knowing that Sunday is coming and that's a full on family day, it, it really gives me hyper focus every other day of the week. And then when Sundays roll around, not that I'm not spending quality time with my kids every day, but that's been transformative to have that one day where it is nothing but family and faith focused. I love I love that. Now you've mentioned uh, spirituality and faith uh, a few times, and um, I've been on my own, and I've been public about my own recent spiritual journey. I used to be very atheist, and then I became agnostic, and, and more recently now I've been pulled um, to the, the the Christian religion quite a bit, and I've learned quite a bit of it. And there was a a moment that I, I re- Justin, Adam, uh, myself, and Doug were invited to listened to Bishop Barron and Arthur Brooks speak. And uh, it was one of the most, uh, you know, Arthur Brooks is a very, I don't know if you, you know who Arthur Brooks yeah, is. A powerful okay. speaker. Yeah. Very, very powerful, effective. Actually, one of the most genuine, nice people I've ever mm-hmm. met in my entire life. He's one of those people you meet every once in a while that you immediately feel their, pos- their energy and you want to yeah. give him a hug. Just a great guy. And he said something so powerful that literally – uh, Justin, Adam, and myself, and Doug looked at e- looked at each other and looked away quickly because all of us were all emotional. The, we were all on the verge of tears. Yeah. I love he, that. Yeah. He said something very powerful, and he said uh, about the power of 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 in, going to church with your children as a father. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, "Here you are, if you're a good father." I'm paraphrasing. He says it much better, but here you are, a good father. Your children see you as the most powerful person uh, in the world. If you do a good job and, and you're a good parent, your children are going to look at you as the ultimate role model. And it's not, a, it's totally not un, uh, you know, unusual for a, a kid, especially a young kid, to think yeah. that their dad- You're the it, strongest person ever. Is the strongest, most powerful, mm-hmm. most whatever, you're, you, and it, which is not a bad thing. You're the protector of the family. Or, you know, So right. they think, and I remember thinking that about my dad. And he says, to go to church, to see the most powerful man in your life bend a knee- Mm-hmm. And, uh, and 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 praise and give great and give uh, you know to someone else. Basically saying I am this one thing's servant or this God's servant. He said, "What a powerful message!" All of us sat there like, "Yeah, what Literally. a very po- what it a is, powerful thing to show your child." You know, the mm-hmm. the perfect the the perfect example of a a father and a, a son is God and Jesus and. A perfect example of of something that fathers can aspire to is to be as great a father as God. And so, when when you are a good father, or you're a powerful father, you're a leader in your home, you're absolutely right. And and you show your kids that you still get down on bended knee, that there's still something that you fear, there's still something you honor, there's still something you have a great deal of reverence around, and it is this you know this creator, this greater power, this absolute truth. I think that that also shows kids that there's even a, there's even a greater rock, there's even a greater foundation. And honestly, I just think the whole idea that there is an absolute truth, that there is absolute morality, you know, in, in my opinion, that, that that's part of the strong fabric that knits cultures together. And and that, that well, your that foundation keeps, is that solid. Keeps morality from unraveling. It's you, not yeah. shakable. You have to. You have to have that. The the very idea of uh, of this country when it started. You know, there was a period of time when anybody could come here. It didn't matter who you were, where you came from. You could come. You were welcome. And you think to yourself, how did that work? You got all these different people, and I've heard people say, oh, they're all Europeans. They're all the same. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life because. Uh, they've been at two world wars with each other. They were very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, very Germans, different. Italians, Irish, you know, they were all very, very, very different. Um, they all came here. How did they all get along? They all had a underlying uh, appreciation, respect, and belief uh, in liberty, in freedom. So this mm-hmm. is how they all got along so that when you say this absolute morality, the only way different people can ever work together and still be very different is if they have one, they have this common thread of something, and that's what this absolute morality. This is why when morality is 
subjective and not objective, you, you run into uh, a lot of different problems. But the question I want to ask you, Ben, you're, you, you, you're, you're very spiritual. Um, you've mentioned uh, you know Jesus and God, so obviously a very strong Christian, but you're also a very analytical, objective, scientific-minded individual. Mm-hmm. So aside from the specifics that you find in Christianity uh, and in your religion, from an objective scientific uh, standpoint, what are the values of having a spiritual practice or a belief system? Are there values? Because these days it seems like that uh, p- there's constantly people are saying there's no value in that. It's silly. It's yeah. uh, it's make believe. Why do we even right. do it? Obviously, it's existed in every Morals culture. Are relative. Yeah, right. every culture mm-hmm. forever has had some kind of a, a strong belief system. So there's obviously value, but what are, from that standpoint, what are the val- Like, why is that important to have? Right. Well, well there, there's two things to consider here. The first is when, when, when you're talking about science and reducing everything to scientism, if you want to call it, everything must be proven. There, there must be a reason for everything. If you trace everything back to its, to its ultimate origin, everything must be explainable. And it's very difficult to be a respected authority in a field of something like fitness or nutrition, you know, as, as kind of like shallow science as, as those fields might be considered to be. And to make to make statements that you want to be respected for when at the same time you have admitted that there comes a certain point where when you've traced something back from tissue to cell to atom to you know, molecule to quark to proton to electron and you know stripped everything down to its tiniest tiniest component you know the tiniest little thread of existence you will get to a point where you can either say well you know we're going to keep on digging because we're going to figure out what came before this and what came before this and what came before this we can eventually explain away everything via science or you get to a certain point where you throw up your hands and you say I don't know. It's it's magic. Some, some, <laughs> some, something made like some higher power that I don't understand made this, and I'm just going to have the faith that that happened, and and resist the even the mild arrogance that I might be able to explain away everything in the universe. And that's tricky to be involved in a field that depends upon science and at the same time, essentially say the equivalent of, yeah, I believe in unicorns and fairies and mm. fairy tales and magic, but I'd rather live in a world of magic where there's deep hope that there's a story written for your life, that there's a big guy upstairs watching out for a buddy, that, that this entire universe around us and all the, the wonder of it from, you know, uh, from, from, you know, smoked clams and, and cannabis to, you know, to sourdough bread and a good red wine to, you know, psilocybin and, and dumbbells and everything. Like these are all wonderful, wonderful works of creation that we can simply enjoy and not necessarily feel that there's an extreme need to have to explain away via science. And well, so that's, that's one part, part of, of really the difficulty is getting to the point where you just say, yeah, I believe in faith. I believe in magic. So, you know, so, you know, judge me for it. And then the other part of it, when it comes to the value of this, you know, we know that there's a lot of data out there about how people who, who are churchgoers tend to have reduced all cause risk of mortality. You know, maybe that's the community. Maybe it's the tiny thimble full glass of hormetic inducing red wine every Sunday. Like who, <laughs> who, who knows? But we know that for a fact. We know that gratitude lowers blood pressure, improves sleep, increases empathy, in, increases self control. We know that this self examination practice increases the, the amount of actual productivity and impact that you make with your life. We know that having a purpose statement actually is associated with higher profile of mood state scores and greater happiness. When you go down the list of all these spiritual disciplines and you read wonderful books by guys like Richard Foster and David Wallace on all the spiritual disciplines, gratitude, service, community, worship, uh, solitude, uh, purpose in life, silence. Um, abstinence. Yeah, you know, that's ab- a big thing. Abstinence, everything. You wind up with the, this list of things that ultimately have deep physical and physiological and psychological Which these people came benefits. from faith. Mm. Right. It's not and, because they had a scientific right. book and, and telling all of it them are them. even fasting, right? Mm-hmm. Fasting did not originate from science. It originated from religion and it was a spiritual it was for spiritual God. health, not yeah. for physical health. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what it was for. Exactly. You know, it's funny when when so for me, what kind of got me, you know, to move in this direction it was a few different things, but well, one of them were some of the ideas that seem to work so well are not obvious. Uh, for example, the idea that, and this comes from uh, religion, 
the idea that all people have uh, are born with inalienable rights, which is you know it's it's in our our founding. What a weird, radical, crazy idea! It's totally not obvious for most of human history. There were kings and queens and peasants mm-hmm. and slaves, and nobody. It, it, no, who would come up with such an insane thing? Mm-hmm. I, from a reasonable, logical standpoint, you can look around at people and observe, and obviously, that's not true. We're all so different. We're all. Some people are born this way. So, so where did that come from? And it came from religion. So that that was one of the things that helped me move in that direction. I mean, that, that that is that is the gospel, right? Like right. God sent his son to die so that the burden and all the shame and all the sin and and all the shit that that we are born with and that we create and that we live with every single day could be taken upon the back of the extreme suffering and pain. Literally a god from the sky came down to take on and it says very clearly in, in the Bible, which I consider to be a source of absolute truth, that that was not just done for like the Jews, not just done for the Gentiles, not just done for the Asians, not just done for the South Americans, every single person, right? The, slave, the, 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 the free, grocer, the slave, woman, the free man. person, mm-hmm. you name it. Everybody is on equal ground when it comes to all of us. And it's entirely not obvious and reasonable to think that anybody would come up with that, especially anybody with any kind of power. Why would you give away? So so it's very interesting to me. The ultimate act of humility. Yeah. Now, I understand that it doesn't prove that there's a a supernatural God. I get that. But boy, the the pragmatic, how pragmatic it is, how effective it is Mm -hmm. at helping create, you know, societies that we value. Boy, is that crazy. The other part is this, is that, um, you know, uh, for, let's talk about science for a second. Yeah. Quantum uh, physics is magic. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah. But let's, it kind of is. The observer effects, it's, it's unexplainable. It, yeah. It's, it's kind of magical. There. But let's talk about science for a second. Science is, uh, I can I can easily make the argument that it's one of the most valuable, powerful, the scientific method has got to be one of the most powerful tools that we've ever come up with. But here's the problem with science. You mentioned scientist, uh, scientism. Um, it, it, it has no morality. It's not supposed to. Science doesn't work uh, if you apply a morality to it. It's supposed to be purely objective. But if you don't have m- people who have an idea of morality within themselves, here's what science turns into. It turns into not should I, but can I? Is this possible? Like, okay, uh, let's, let's, let's hybrid humans with gorillas and see how strong they can get. Yeah. Let's uh, create, let's have children out of the womb because that's convenient. Let's, uh, you know what? All Human these pe- monkey embryos. Yeah. Oh, you know, uh, eugenics. Eugenics is an idea. It's such a terrible idea, right? That we need to get rid of the Horrific genetically idea. bad people to have a pure, perfect race. From a scientific standpoint and objective for the collective, it mm-hmm. makes perfect yeah, once, sense. Once science becomes absolute truth, you, you are on a very slippery slope towards an absence of morality because there there is no consideration of whether well, something is right or wrong, is. just whether something is true or false. And what's really interesting is a, is a book that I recently read. It was when we were in uh, – uh, um, actually, it was when the boys and I were in Dubai, I think. I was reading this book on the plane. And I, I sent you this book, Jess, and I'm forgetting. It, it's about how every single culture has this this one great God in the sky who who actually is this source of truth and is this this source of right and wrong. Many many cultures have no idea who Jesus was, a gospel, sacrifice, sin, any of that stuff, mm-hmm. but they know like there's this one God who has created an, an uh, like a deep truth and, and morality that goes beyond. And it's going to drive me Greeks nuts that I can't remember. God. I can't remember what the name of the book mm-hmm. is, but. Essentially, what it comes down to is there is head knowing and there is heart knowing. Head knowing is science, right? Like I know whether something is true or false. I can use reasoning. I can use logic. I can explain away the observer effect by maybe talking about how like particles would interact with the photon. And there's got to be a way to explain this. And then heart knowing is basically just I just know because I know. Mm. I know that I should not walk up uh, on the street to the person holding a wonderful aromatic loaf of sourdough bread, hold a gun to their head, pull the trigger and walk away with their bread because I wanted it. And that Mm -hmm. felt right to me, right? Like everybody knows in their heart, like that's the heart knowing, you know, even you may not be able to explain, but you know, deep down inside, because you could try to explain what you you could say, Oh, you did it. Cause that makes you happy. And that's, and, 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 you know, morality comes from what makes you happy, but did it make the other person happy? Here's here's an interesting thought experiment, uh, experiment along those lines. It's like you ask somebody, if you could go back in time and kill Hitler when he was a baby, would you do it? 
And some people might say, well, yeah, I would save lots of people. If you really think about it, he's not Hitler yet, right? He's a baby. He hasn't done anything yet. So your heart knows that would actually be wrong, even though theoretically I could prevent all this other, you know, stuff from happening. It's wisdom. It's also a very unrealistic scenario. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it never actually yeah. run into but, but, like okay, that. But, okay, so, 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 obviously, so fitness is my expertise. So I like to take things to fitness because that's where I understand the most, I would say. And there's a lot of wisdom in fitness, and I'll explain. Oftentimes, so we do episodes called uh, Quas, right, where, where people ask us questions and we answer those questions. And there's a question that pops up all the time, which is, if scientists invented a pill that made you fit, lean, and healthy, uh, regardless of what you ate and what you did, uh, mm-hmm. would that be a good thing? Now, uh, for, for somebody who's been, you know, who's took this seriously, understood this study, this worked with people for well over two decades, I have developed a level of wisdom with fitness that is beyond the, you know, you get fit, you build muscle, you burn body fat. And so when I hear that, I understand that, yeah, you'll get people who are lean, you know, more muscle, mobile, and that kind of stuff, but they're not going to get the true value yeah, that you get. The value is the empty now. The, the, the value is in the discipline and the abstinence and the journey. It's the journey, not the destination. It's always the journey. And so that's something that's totally different from the, the, the reason and the logic because the science would say the pill would solve everybody's problem. But here's, here's another example. You have people who seem to have everything that you think that you would want from a logical standpoint, money, power, sex, drugs, fame, and their suicide rate is through the roof. What does that tell you? I would take that or pill daily suicidal. if it was on top of a mountain and I had to climb up the mountain every morning to get the pill. I'll take it. <laughs> exactly. So I want to I want to take a, a a left turn here or whatever turn here and and ask you a little bit about homeschooling. I know you guys are big homeschooling. First, let's talk about Jess's shirt. Uh, did you watch Tiger King? <laughs> That's I did. A, he did. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great shirt. That's I, a, I had to point that out. I've That's only all. seen a couple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so, even know what Tiger King is. Free Joe Exotic. <laughs> Right, yeah, let's, let's get back to it. You know, I'm glad you don't know. It's a total yeah. waste of your time. It is. So, so <laughs> we, you mentioned unschooling, which is a form of homeschooling. I had friends who were big in the homeschooling world, and when I, I started training them, they were, that's how I, I, I met them, and I was very skeptical when they would tell me about what they did. They were unschoolers, and I thought, oh boy, I hope their kid doesn't turn out whatever. Anyway, he turned out to be one of the best young men uh, I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought he would be lazy and he'd, oh, he's just going to play video games all day. No, this kid is an entrepreneur, started his own podcast. He's Mm -hmm. become a personal trainer. He's uh, a go-getter, very, very balanced, uh, a well-adjusted young man. no friends. He's depressed. He cries himself to sleep at night. Yeah, right. right. None of that stuff. (laughs) Now, now, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, myth around uh, or or, or just uh, incorrect uh, knowledge or information around homeschooling. And and, and along those lines, homeschooling has exploded, not just recently because of COVID, but over the last 10 years, it's exploded a lot. First off, why do you think that is? Why do you think more and more parents, and it's growing exponentially. This is real now. In fact, uh, the the public school system is actually quite worried about the fact that more and more people are are homeschooling. Why do you think it's exploded so much? And then I I do want to get into unschooling and what that means. I actually, I posed this question to one of my girlfriends whose kids are in public school. And I, during all of this stuff in, in, and recent laws that have been passed passed in Washington. And I said to her, I was like, and I said, don't take this as offensive, but I was like, how do you feel dropping your kid off at the state every day and allowing them to pour themselves into your child rather than you pouring yourself into your child? Like, that's a really honest question. And I wasn't trying to be offensive or rude, but, and, and say that you're doing it wrong. I just really want to pour my values and my my um yeah my values into my child rather than allowing the state to pour their mm-hmm. values into the into I, all I of think, our children i think really. that um that is it it it's good that a parent would want to be with their kids more and want more quality time it's not about time being with your kids more with their it's about kids or want to your value want, want to be able mm-hmm. to instill more of of their family's values into their children but I think that the human psychology of someone else being able to educate a child and you could drop them off and go to work and fulfill sure. your Maslow's hierarchy while somebody else does the work actually would make homeschooling a less popular notion. And so I think the reason that homeschooling has become more popular 
is multifactorial, but a big one is technology. Yeah, oh, it makes big it easier. Remote yeah. working. Yes. Like the ease of being able to find information, find teachers, find tutors, have Absolutely. that be scalable and affordable has made it so that you can homeschool anyone anywhere in the world. And you can, you can, I mean, compared to even what you could do 20 years ago, have an amazing, amazing education for a child. And then mm-hmm. I think that when you pair that with a little bit of, of social unrest, you know, increasing school violence, mm-hmm. increasing bullying, uh, increasing amounts of, of depression and loneliness and suicidal tendencies among children who are simply in an effed up social environment in, in many cases in, in you know, public school or even some cases in, in private, private school type too. of situation dictates that. I, I, I think a lot of parents are aware that a school might not be the best place. A traditional school might not be the best place for their kids to be during the day. And as that awareness grows, what I've seen are, you know, I've seen a growth of homeschooling, but I've seen this real shift towards the notion of creative free play, AKA unschooling, AKA find out what your kids' passions and interests are, find out what makes them truly excited, what they really want to study, what they're truly interested in, then surround them with as many arts and crafts and tutors and computer programs and games and activities and museum tickets and everything that they would need to be able to pursue that passion and then step back and just lightly guide them, you know, make sure they've got a they've got somebody to drive them to the place they want to be driven to and they've got some cooking class or make sure that they know how to log into the computer for some class they want to take online. So lightly guide them and and then just surround them and then the other important part of unschooling and this is very similar to that love and logic approach right like use love and logic but also discipline so unschool but also realize there are certain skills that your child is going to highly benefit from having experienced in life that they might not know about yet when they're six or eight or ten years old you know naval ravikant great modern day thinker and and philosopher right you know I, i love a lot of the work that he does he says there's essentially five key tools that a child needs to be able to excel in no matter what career that they go into and those are reading writing right so so being able to consume information at an efficient pace writing, being able to express thought clearly on written in written form on paper or, or via keyboard, uh, arithmetic, being able to, to just do basic figuring, whether it's geometry or building or woodworking or anything that involves basic math skills. And then finally, uh, logic or computer programming, right, which are technically synonymous, right, like mm, logic slash right. computer programming, and then rhetoric slash persuasion. If you can weave in mm, sales, reading, yeah. writing, math, logic slash persuasion and, and or logic slash computer programming and rhetoric slash persuasion, then your child is really going to be set for life. And so we, we have 12 core subjects that Washington state requires us to show that our child has checked the box for, you know, like mm. they did chemistry this week. Well, yeah, sure. They learned how to make a ravioli, right? And that, that counts as mm. kitchen chemistry. Mm. So we'll classify that as chemistry, but then I'm also very careful to ensure that even if they, that, cause there's some weeks they don't want to take their online mathnasium class. Uh, like they probably week. would not be doing logic puzzles <laughs> right now if dad wasn't paying him five bucks every time they successfully completed a really hard logic puzzle in this logic book that I got for them. So there are certain little things I nudge them towards that I know they aren't super interested in, but that are going to serve them well in life. And then everything else is you know, weekly family meeting. What are you guys passionate about? What do you want to learn? Um, okay. One local assistant who helps to drive them around and you know, get them to different activities. One virtual assistant who kind of helps us keep track of all their different passions and interests and you know which block of the year are we going to kind of focus on whatever woodworking and which block of the year we're going to focus on building the tree fort and which block are we going to do more wilderness survival and plant foraging. And we just keep a running list of all the things they're interested in and weave those in throughout the year. And it's scary because there is no model. There, yeah. there is no proven model. You, There's you no one right way to do it here and there. Um, and you want, you know, you, you almost want like a, a set pattern habit or routine. Cause that's what we all grew up with, with schooling. Mm-hmm. Once you realize it doesn't have to be that way and that kids actually learn really well through this concept of free creative play, um, so it, that's it what works really well. So essentially unschooling is no real curriculum. hard structure. Yeah, no curriculum, really, curriculum. Right? And, you know, here's the thing. Here's my argument in support of what you're saying. I'm glad you explained that uh, and you did it so well. Um, modern society is, is a lot of specialization. Uh, you go to work and you're probably really good at a couple things and that's how modern society works. You don't need to know everything uh, or, or lots of little things. You kind of need to be really good at one thing. And for anybody who's, I mean, anybody who has kids, you know when your kid is into something, like when my boy was four years old, 
you know, he loved Thomas the Train, the train set, the little trains. And there's like, I don't know, 300 oh, figurines a, yeah. or I don't know, maybe thousands, <laughs> right? And so I, I saw that he was really into it and he'd build the trains. So I bought him. He, might, he had to have at least 100 and something trains. He knew every single name, every sing, at four years old. Every, there were two trains that were twins. I could not tell the difference. He could. It took me days to figure out how he was doing it. And you know what it was? It was the direction of the eyebrows were slightly off on wow. one or the other. And it's because he was into it. You know, they're like little tiny sponges. So what are you seeing unfolding with your kids right now? What are you, what, what are you noticing? Are you, can you, do you guys feel like you can kind of predict what they're going to be into or what they're going to do when they get older by now? Well, they've been saying what they want to do since they were they, like three or four. They both love art and writing. Mm -hmm. They 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 love cooking. They have a cooking podcast, and even even above like cooking and food prep, they like to create art. Both of their purpose statements are based around inspiring people to joy and adventure with their art and with their writing. River does a little bit more of the writing. Taryn does a little bit more of the art. And they really want to do a lot more publishing of their own books. Oh, they cool. want to mm -hmm. live in Moscow, Idaho, 90 minutes from our house where all their nieces and nephews reside. And they want to live down there and make books and kind of have like a little coffee shop that they run during the day and then write books, you know, in the evening or in their off time. And that's what they want to do right now is, you know, be authors and own a coffee shop, which, mm -hmm. you know, that, that might change a year from now. They might want to be professional tennis players. You, know, you, <laughs> yeah. you never know, but you just, you sit back and you just let them pursue their passions and resist the urge to push them towards the stuff <laughs> that you really thought that they were going to be good at because living vicariously through your children is so easy yeah. to do. It's how, cruel. What are you, uh, how are you guys teaching them finances right now? Uh, they've got these books called the Tuttle Twin books that are a little bit more of kind of a libertarian conservative uh, approach to the economy and the finances. They... Uh, go through each month with their actually they're they're once a week right now with their their podcast producer mm -hmm. and manager the financials you know what they're bringing in from each affiliate what percentage the the affiliates are oh great are. they yeah. they go grocery shopping with mom and with our assistant to help you know manage things like you know finding deals and finding mm -hmm. discounts same thing on Amazon they leave the tip when we go to restaurants whenever we're playing card games you know they're in charge of keeping track of the you know, the, the, the numbers and, and the digits and, um, and it's great cause it's all yeah. real life. I mean, yeah. this is all stuff that you're gonna have to deal with. Yeah. So and do the, you, do you guys allow them to be buy whatever they want freely or how, how does that work for them saving and spending? Right. So, so anytime they're actually pretty big savers, yeah, yeah they're, they're big into <laughs> saving, but again, we are too, like, we're just not like we drive a Toyota Highlander and, yep. you know, Dodge pickup and we, we don't live very fancy flashy life you know flashy lifestyle I, you know this shirt cost me 10 bucks from the thrift store and Justin <laughs> makes our furniture and like we we live pretty simple and so i think they just they've, they've never really grown up being spendthrifts mm. we don't live with the spirit of scarcity but we also just we're not spent we don't spend a lot of money on, on random items but the understanding in our house is that if it's related to education especially if it's a book no questions asked i will buy it for them I, I will provide them anything that really fuels something that they want to mm -hmm. learn about, something they're passionate about. If it's a Nerf gun, if it's a Lego toy, whatever, then what they do is they send to my assistant, Marge, who does a lot of our shopping, what, what they would like. And they, you know, they have their little email addresses. She finds the best deal and she comes back and tells us how much it is. Then they decide if they want to get it. If they do, she then transfers from their bank accounts where all their affiliate income from their podcast goes, where, you know, any, any money that they make, you know, gifts that they get for their birthday or Christmas or whatever. And she'll do a transfer. And so they know that when they bought that, it gets transferred, you know, it goes, it's purchased using our Amazon account, but then the transfer occurs from their account into ours. So they're covering. And they have the freedom to, I mean, if they decide to go on a crazy yeah. addiction of Nerf guns and yeah. buy them every day, technically yeah. could with their own money they, they could their own money, they yeah. could they could do w whatever they want with their own money but again like because they see mom i mean they they see me spending and this is almost too much they'll, they'll see me spending 10 minutes deliberating over you know which double a batteries to get on amazon because one pack's like two dollars cheaper right so <laughs> so we're we're pretty aware of spending in our home so i think they're they're pretty used to just the 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 value of of saving slash investing I haven't taken them through any investing courses or anything like that yet, but mm, you know, it's, that's uh, awesome. One thing that I've, I've heard from people, and this one's actually quite a disturbing uh, comment I'll get on homeschooling is they'll say things like, well, there's a lot of parents out there that are really bad. The kids shouldn't be 
Uh, you know, the, the parents, a lot of parents shouldn't school their kids and they should go. And to me, this is always a, a such a, a, a yeah. disturbing thing to hear because, of course, there's bad parents out there. Uh, but if you added it all up and you did the, the math and the study, uh, I would trust a parent raising their kid over uh, the state uh, raising your kid, mainly because parents yeah, or, usually or, care about their kids or, or, more. Or a co-op or, or a collective, I mean, or sure. a homeschooling mm-hmm. group. Like, like there are ways that a parent can be involved in their children's education. And if they don't have the heart of a teacher or they're, mm-hmm. frankly, a shitty teacher, like there, there are ways that you can homeschool I'm or unschool and not be. <laughs> not. Well, no, Jess is a wonderful teacher for arts yeah. or crafts or gardening, but she's not going to teach the kids calculus or science because she didn't she didn't learn that stuff in college. She doesn't have a passion for it. So that's a big part is whatever your kids are interested in, you find the person that's going to do the best job teaching them that. It might not be you, and that's okay. Yeah. So a little speculation. Do you? How do you think? What do you think is going to happen with the current education model now that uh, formal education, the, the cost of it is it's been exploding for years, far faster than inflation. Schools are now a lot. Per, you know, either shutting down, not, kids can't go there, so kids are at home, or um, you have to go to school and you have to wear a mask and do this whole thing, which can be very anxiety inducing, I'm mm-hmm. sure, in children. They don't know what's going on. Or you have schools that are saying, hey, like Harvard, for example, said uh, next year, all online. Oh, by the way, it's still $50,000 a year yeah. tuition. We're not changing the cost. How, speculating moving forward, do you think that we're witnessing the beginning of the end of the way that school has been administered because of all these stresses now? And then, of course, technology making it. Uh, so inexpensive to transmit mm-hmm. and receive information. What do you th- what do you see moving forward with that? I've, I I personally think a hundred years from now we're going to look back and, and laugh at about the past sixty years or so of education that we've tried to yeah. hang on to the threads of that is all Grasping. based off the agricultural mm-hmm. revolution and the design of factory workers and and it, it's laughable. I really don't anticipate that model sticking around much longer. And who knows? We might be in the time right now during the COVID pandemic where it's a full on light bulb moment and people really do realize, oh shit, I was paying $50,000 to go to Harvard and they've just admitted that everything that I'm getting from there, I could literally be yeah. doing from a beach in Thailand for while, free. while simultaneously running a surfing Or for company. significantly less. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Well, you guys are you're you're always a great guest, Ben, and I loved having you on, Jessa. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is great. You guys are <laughs> both very, very good people. I love uh, hearing about how you guys are at home and, and how everything's going on, and I wish you guys uh, continued blessings and success with with everything. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks for letting us emerge from our our little hole in the uh, state <laughs> yeah, about you, you see people well you know you're Crawled always welcome from under our rock yeah, that's yeah. Right. you're always yeah. welcome on our podcast Dude, see, so. it's, it's like it's like a direct flight yeah, yeah. yeah. From the excellent yeah. we just gotta get you guys up to spokane sometime we're due yeah. we're due, yeah, for we're due. due. You are due. Yeah, yeah. we haven't been there yeah. in a while so all yeah. right guys thanks all right thanks, thanks guys you. I think my parents thought for a second that they were getting in trouble for smuggling like salamis and shit because you sp- <laughs> 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 importing. You're not meat. supposed to do that, right? <laughs> but I think they had like cheeses and salamis and stuff, uh, so I could tell like the panic, you know, on their face, like, like, oh fuck, they caught us, you know. Yeah. And then they pulled out my cap gun, and the look my mom gave me 